All right, what's going on, guys? So I just got back from uh, doing a lesson with Annie, the poodle that I did a board and train with here a few weeks ago, if you remember. She was with me about a month. I would have kept her longer if I didn't have to travel, okay? So one of the things I hear most from young trainers, something that young trainers really struggle with, are go-home lessons after a board and train. A lot of trainers, if not most trainers, dread those go-home lessons, right? They could be very stressful and you worry that the dog's going to do what it's capable of doing. So it's a lot. And most people don't really know what to do, how to get the most out of them. So I'm, I'm literally going to give you kind of an idea of everything I did today and why. First of all, this is the second time that I'm down here with Annie at her house. The first time was when I returned her. I don't do go home lessons if the owner lives locally to me. When I say locally, I mean literally within two hours, okay? And here's why. And it took me a long time to learn this. When a dog is away from their owner for a month or longer, the owner, the family is away from the dog. No one's in a mindset to like crack down and start training. So for me, when I return a dog home, now I spent about two hours with Annie and her owner, but we didn't really train. We talked about a lot of things, kind of explained what to expect. You know, went over a couple of little things that she had concerns with only because Annie has a lot of little quirky behaviors. But in reality, I tell people, just enjoy your dog. And they get nervous, like, well, what should we do? I said, just enjoy your dog. There's no rules right now, okay? I'll give the dog a week to settle in then when I come back, the training starts. Don't worry about it. And that has worked out so much better over the years. I wish I would have understood that from day one, right? So now today is the first actual training session with Annie. And so I do something a little different, but again, I'll explain to you why. I come down here today and I don't plan on being here very long, okay? I wound up being here like an hour and a half. I planned on like 30 minutes, but that never happens. The thing I started Annie's owner off with, and not just Annie's owner, I do this for most board and train go homes. And there's a reason why. So most may think we're gonna start working on obedience, all the, the basic things, the sit, the down, the come, the place, all that stuff, you know, e-collars, prong collars, all that stuff. I do things a little differently. The first thing that I focused on with Annie and her owner is old school long line work. Now, I used to take for granted and think that everyone knew what long line work was. So when I ask a young trainer, hey, have you done the long line work? Let me see what you're doing. And they send me videos. And what a lot of trainers today do is they put the dog on a long line and they practice recalls. That's not long line work. Like that's how far dog training has gone to the negative side where we don't understand the most simple basic things, right? And old school Keeler style long line work is so valuable for so many reasons. Let me explain to you why I start off with that. The biggest reason is because for most dog owners, everyday dog owners, the hardest thing for them to do is nothing. Is nothing. It's very difficult for them to do nothing. They've created so many bad habits with their communication, over communication, but a lack of communication at the same time, meaning they talk a lot to their dog. They give a lot of commands that really don't pan out and can't be reinforced. They spend a lot of time accommodating their dog, looking to see where their dog is when it is on leash, right? The leash goes on, there's constant tension. It starts off tight immediately. So all these little things create a ton of bad habits. I like starting off with the long line work because it forces the owner to learn how to do nothing. And that's very difficult, right? So I ask them very simply, I say, do me a favor for an hour before we're going to work, put your dog in the crate, in Annie's case, a pen, 
and just leave her there for an hour and do nothing. Don't interact with her, don't do nothing. When you go to her, put the leash on, don't say nothing, come out, we're gonna start the long line work. Now, I showed her what to do over the following week. I showed her how to hold the leash properly. Um, Annie uh, uh, likes to run and gets crazy and her owner's already been injured by Annie pulling her and knocking her over and stuff. So I show her how to hold the leash properly. So if Annie takes off, she has that leash secure and she doesn't get hurt. And then I gave very best basic instructions. I set up three points for her, like a triangle. And I said, now you're going to do nothing. You're going to walk to that next point. You're going to stay there until I tell you to move. Then you're gonna to come to this point. You're gonna to come to this point. And I showed her what we're gonna do the first two days, what she's gonna do on her own the first two days. And that was nothing. Just walk. See, Annie knows this stuff. She knows all the basics already. But now it's time to educate her owner so now we can start moving forward and get some real everlasting results. True results, right? So I had her do two or three repetitions like that, which she's going to do on, on day one and two, right? Then I explained to her what she's going to do on day three and day four, where we start going the opposite direction of the dog when the dog takes off, okay? Okay. And we went over that real quickly. And then after a couple of repetitions to that, I went behind one of the points that she was going to walk to. And when she was walking to me, I show her what we're gonna start doing on day five and six. And as she's coming towards me, I start clapping my hand and looking happy because I know Annie's gonna wanna come run over to me. And then I had the owner turn around and go the other way really quickly. And Annie starts to realize, oh, okay. I see, I have to stay with mom no matter what, even if Uncle Larry, the guy who taught me, wants me to go to him. I never called her to me, right? I just made it appear that I was happy to see her. That's not for Annie. That's so the owner comprehends what we're doing. And then it starts clicking. She goes, oh, okay. So basically, no matter what, she's learning she has to be with me. Absolutely, super easy, right? And we stop and we're talking and I'm going over a lot of the reasons why this is so important. And literally, as I start to tell her, I, it, the words, I wish I was filming this, the words started coming out of my mouth when I said, here it is, Terry, and I love Terry. Today. Terry, I know you're gonna see this. I absolutely adore you. I adore you, I adore your family, right? So as I start saying, Terry, the hardest thing for most people to do is to do nothing. And just as I say that, she goes down and starts loving on her dog. And I and I just yelled at her, what are you doing? And she caught herself, oh, I'm not supposed to praise her? No, 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 no. But that's why it's so important to do this very basic fundamental stuff, right? This is just the groundwork for what we're going to do. And so that's why I start very often, not always, but very often with the long line work, because it takes an everyday dog owner and teaches them how to break all their bad habits and do nothing, right? Then she had some questions with the obedience. She's saying, you know, she doesn't want to stay when I put her in a down or this and that. That's okay, let's work. We got the long line on. Now I'm going to have you do some work. And we just went over basic sit stays and down stays and stuff like that. And if, you know, if, if Annie broke it, I showed her what to do when the dog does not listen what to do when the dog doesn't down when you ask it to, what to do when the dog breaks the down. These are things that are very important. You have to be hands-on in teaching these skills because it doesn't come easy to everyone. Most people want to negotiate with the dog instead of just showing them what you want. Most people do this stuff without a leash on and then you don't have a way to reinforce this stuff. So we explain how important the leash is. And of course she did very well. So then, now Annie's holding her positions like she's going to, so we're going to change it, right? If you guys remember the issues Annie had with the e-collar, as soon as an e-collar went on her, like without any work, she just became very wacky. That's how she is with everything, anything new, right? So it's become a lot of, you know, a normal part of her life, and, and Terry puts it on a little bit every day for a few hours here and there. But please understand, guys, I can't stress this enough. Terry's not using that e-collar. We're not using that e-collar with the obedience. We're not getting on the e-collar if the dog gets out of it down. We're not doing any of that stuff. It's there for one reason and one reason only. To keep that dog safe when she's off leash, right? Or to reinforce something when the dog doesn't want to come to us when there's something more interesting. So I'll give you an example. 
She's already doing much better with Terry and she takes her out a lot. She takes her to her studio. She runs a dance studio. And she tells me the other day that she said, you know, I came home and I let her out of the car with no leash or anything. And she just followed me to the house. Now, mind you, Terry has a very big front yard and there's a, a road there where cars come flying past. So God forbid Annie ever took off, it's very dangerous. And she said, you know, it was great. I just let her out of the car, no leash. And she just followed me to the house. I said, that's fantastic, Terry. I said, but here's why I want you to have the e-collar on in that situation. For one, always prepare for what if. So now what if you were driving down that driveway and Annie saw there's a deer on your front yard, there are deer there. And when you let her out, she takes off. You don't have any way to protect her, to keep her safe, to get her back to you when there's a deer taking off, right? It'd be great if she came to you when you called her and that's a possibility, she may, but you don't know that. So these little opportunities to start getting used to having the e-collar on when she is off leash, even if it's around your house are very vital, right? So I'll give you another example. I say, okay, let's go back into the yard now. And now, now Annie doesn't act all freaked out when the collar's on, so that's nice. So we go outside with Annie and we take her off the leash and we're not working with the e-collar. We're not doing anything with it. But now we start putting Annie back in downstays and stuff. And you could see with Terry, she doesn't understand her release command because Terry, was confused and using a reward marker when she shouldn't and she hasn't been working on the release command. So these are things we have to straighten out because for example, I had her put Annie in down and say, okay, just release her, tell her free dog. And when Terry said it, she looked at her like she went to move, but then she caught herself and she's looking like, am I supposed to move? So the dog's telling you, hey, I'm not sure what that means from you. So we have to teach her. We have to build that, right? But now, this is what we did next. We put her in a down, and we have been practicing this today, Terry moving around different directions, and she was doing great. And we'd go to her and release her. Sometimes we'd call her to her, mixing it up. But now I had her put her down at one end of the yard, and we started walking toward the house. I did that on purpose. And Annie broke the down. Why? Because she's used to following Terry back to the house. I know she's going to break that. So I have Terry tell her no and bring her right back to where she was. She has to let her know, unless I release you, you can't get out of that position. Why is that important? We can't allow the dog to anticipate things like that because that becomes a problem. That could be dangerous, right? You put the dog in a down or you're doing something because there's something dangerous around. There's cars, you're in a busy area. And the dog just thinks, oh, I'm supposed to get up and move because of this. That's an issue, right? So we put her in the down, walked towards the house she broke. I said, tell her no. And she told her no, brought her right back to where she was and put her down. Now we go over by the house. Now the dog is holding the down. This is where the e-collar comes to play. This was very important for Terry to see. So now I have her call her again. And I can almost guarantee that when she calls her to her, she's going to hesitate because in the dog's mind, hey, I just got up and came to you and you told me I was wrong, you put me back. So now even though Terry called her, she's going to hesitate. So Terry called her, she says, Annie, come. And she didn't move. At that moment, I just tapped the e-collar, still not like in a, super aversive mode, but aversive enough to Annie because she doesn't like anything from the e-collar, right? One time and she comes running over and I said, make sure you praise her for that. And she praised her, good time, good time, good job. So now I take her, we put her in the down in the same exact area, same place. And I have Terry do the same thing because I know she's going to come to her down. Now she calls her Annie come and she comes running immediately. She just had a nice little learning sequence there. She broke the down because she thought she was supposed to because we were headed towards the house. We showed her wrong answer, right? We put her back in the down, we called her. She assumed she's supposed to stay there. When she doesn't respond to the recall, we reinforced it with a tap, just aversive enough to let the dog know you have to come to us, right? 
So then when we put her back for that third time, now she knows, okay, yes, this makes sense. Now she's learning, but more importantly, Terry's learning, right? One other little thing I had Terry do, she's affectionate with Annie and she should be. I want her to be, right? But when Annie was in a downstay, I said, okay, go to her and praise that. Because I know Terry's not gonna go to her and say, hey, good job, girl, I like what you're doing. She's gonna get down, she's gonna rub on her, good girl, Annie, so good, you know, and she's going to touch her and rub on her. And then I said, okay, love on her, praise on her, and then walk away. And she did, and Annie followed. I said, do you understand how you just gave her permission with that praise? The overpraise, the overexcitement, the dog takes as permission to break the down. I said, mark that, no, I didn't tell you you can move just because I loved on you. Now put her back in the down, walk away, right? And we did that. Then I have her go back to her and praise her properly. She could still touch her. Hey, good job, mama. Give her a little loving, walk away, then release her. And again, the dog learns something. This isn't sexy. This isn't exciting. But the dog is learning from the owner now. And the owner is learning. Terry's not going to understand this stuff after one lesson or two lessons or three lessons. We're going to keep working until it's second nature for her. And we take all of her bad habits, all the bad habits that the everyday dog owners have, and we replace them with good habits. And she's gonna have a tremendous life with this dog. She's going to be amazing. So next time we meet, we'll go someplace a little busier and we'll start doing all the stuff that Annie knows and we'll start pushing her a little bit. And then we're gonna go grab a nice lunch someplace on a nice patio when the weather's nice and Annie's coming with us. And we're gonna start introducing her to the real world. That's how my board and trains operate. When that dog goes home, that's only the beginning. That's only the start. And every owner is different, just like every dog is different. So I have to provide that owner with very, very simple, basic things that they can do on a daily basis. No bullshit, no, no sexiness, no fancy bullshit that people can't comprehend or do like simple stuff that she could do within her daily routine where it becomes effortless and the dog keeps progressing and getting better. So I hope that helps just one young trainer understand why you hate doing go home so much. I hope this helps just somebody because when I started figuring this out, guys, I also used to dread the go home lesson, dread it. Like straight up anxiety and stress, I hated it. When I started figuring this out, I no longer worried about that, okay? If you have any questions, you could post them here. Peace.